What's good everybody, Point Blank Games here, and you're about to watch the death-defying, phenomenal, amazing stylings of Long Boys Post 1975. That man was a genius. That man is a personal hero of mine. A personal hero of my generation. Now if you don't know who he is, you're probably looking at him and thinking, he really isn't much to look at. And I agree with you, he isn't much to look at. Although having said that, if you saw the women he was banging back in the day, whew, let's just say someone must be packing quite the impressive piece of hardware themselves. But he bought us the ZX80 personal computer, the ZX81 personal computer, and he bought us what I'm about to show you now. So after my vintage adventures in the attic the other day, I did actually find some of my Spectrums because I actually went up there to find my Spectrum Plus 3 which ironically I found the manual for but not the machine but this is the first computer I ever owned I ever played if you're from my generation then this is an icon this is instantly recognizable this is the machine that turned my generation into gamers this thing Put it this way, before this, the only gaming experience I ever had was like tabletop games by Grand Slam, you know, like Astro Wars and things like that. And a Pong machine, you know, the one with eight built-in versions of Pong and two shooting games. I say shooting games. You had this immense looking gun, but you just shot it while well, floating white squares on the screen. So this machine is, you know, this is a massive, massive part of my childhood. There are two in here. This is... A Sinclair ZX Spectrum 48K and this is a 16K because this here is obviously not white. I think I got that the right way around. There is a, an extension pack that you could plug in the back of this with an extra 32K of RAM that made this a 48K machine as well. Anyone uh, in the United Kingdom will immediately recognize this. Anyone from, well, from North America probably thinks this is the strangest looking computer they've ever seen and that's because it kind of is it actually has rubber keys you know it's a horrible keyboard it is actually referred to as the rubber mat there was a machine after this uh, 48k plus it came with a plastic keyboard but once again it wasn't a proper keyboard because all the keys were kind of at the same height and touched each other around the edges so yeah very very odd machine that that's actually the reason that this is empty because you could either buy a 48k plus or you could do what my dad did at the time which is buy the actual well the body and um put the workings or the innards from this inside it so that's why that one is empty the cool thing about the spectrum though was it was really 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 easy to program on because i don't know if you can see that numerous commands on and around the keys so you know using a combination of shift and button combinations you could basically spell whole words out by pressing one key making it absolutely incredibly easy to program for which is probably why the software in this the software was in the thousands absolutely in the thousands We've also got a uh, a cheetah 125 plus joystick looks like a quick shot too this was a this was an awesome joystick it's got a turbo button down there now this is the funny thing which you get with Sinclair where they missed the point. This was their joystick, yeah. This came out after this. That's actually when Amstrad owned it, but we'll get to that. So, you know, like, wh why would you even make that when you got that beast on the market? There's actually a light gun in there as well. This was going towards the end of its life. You notice how it looks pretty much the same as a Sega Master System light gun. I can't remember why. I think even though it's Sinclair branded, I could be wrong, someone out there may know more about it than me. There was some deal with Virgin going on, obviously Virgin with people who released the Sega Master System in this country. In order to use a 
joystick, you needed an interface, which then we would plug in the back of the expansion socket on the machine, like so, and then obviously your joystick goes in here. Now this probably looks, like I said, to anyone who's never seen one before, you're probably thinking this is just the most archaic, basic looking thing you've ever seen. And yes it was, but I've just got so many good memories, there was so much software on this, it was, it was ridiculous. Now I also found a couple of books up there with them as well. Now like I said, the machine was so incredibly easy to program for. Time consuming mine, very time consuming, but incredibly easy to program for. You could just buy tons of books like this where you could actually program your own games. Literally, you, you, you bought a book and if you put it all in, you had a game. What an awesome name for a game. Holiday Expenses. Calculate all your currency needs for a trip through several countries. Man, that's got to be addictive. But yeah, basically lines and lines of text, or basic. And when you got to the end, I think you just typed run, I can't remember, when you had all the text on the screen, and you had a game. Another one there, uh, more ventures for your spectrum. This is quite interesting. This is a proper flashback. This is the original manual that came with the original Spectrum 48K. See, check it out. First edition, 1982. Basic looking manual by today's standards. Here you go. Now this was what was also revolutionary about the Spectrum at the time because there were a ton, there were a ton of computers in the early 80s in this country all by different companies, all, you know, different people trying to jump on the bandwagon because computer technology was the new big thing. And they were really, really expensive. And Sir Clive Sinclair knew this. So that's why, he, you know, he he already developed two computers previous to this, the ZX80 and the ZX81, who um, basically had an absolutely amazingly massive 1K of RAM. But they sold well enough. And um, by the way, they used to overheat really, really badly in the official guide in a magazine at the time to stop your ZX80 or ZX81 overheating was to take a pint of milk out the fridge and stand it on the back of the computer. I shit you not. But yeah, so so Clive Sinclair basically saw, you know, if, if he could manufacture a computer, if he could manufacture a computer and keep the price down, you know, it, he was quids in. So he decided the other way to save cost on it was simply to have it connect to a TV. So it's got an RF out, you know. It's, there you go, RF out, and obviously that would eliminate the need for an expensive monitor, and also you could load games into it by just connecting it to a set recorder, because it's got a mic and a, I not the right way around, a mic and an ear socket. Interestingly enough, by the way, the machine that followed this up actually had a reset button on the side, because to turn the machine on or off, if it crashed or anything like that, everyone I knew used to pull the power out here and put it back in, but basically over the years of its life, it got to the point when you did that so much that you would damage the machine. So they kind of picked up on this, Sinclair, and they actually put a reset button on the machine that followed it up. A whole bunch of monthly computer magazines that basically taught you how to use your computer, taught you how to program. Um, I, like most people of my generation, were probably bought a Spectrum in the sense that it was an educational tool. We could learn something from it. We could learn programming, you know, it would improve our schoolwork. But, and I'm pretty sure most parents realise this. No one cared, cared about that. The minute we found out we could play games on our Spectrum, that's all we gave two tits for. Alright, let's talk specs. ZX Spectrum 48K released in 1982. It ran on a Zilog Z80A CPU, running at a massive 3.5 MHz. Yeah, I know, this thing's a beast. Um, eight different models were actually made in its lifespan in the UK before it was discontinued in 1992 and the company was eventually bought by Amstrad in 1986 who made the rival series of home computers, the Amstrad CPC-64 and CPC-128. One was cassette based, one was disc based, which is eventually how the models of the Spectrum they release would be. Uh, you had the 128K Plus 2, which had a building cassette recorder, and the 128K Plus 3, which is the one I had and have yet to find in the attic, which had a built-in disk drive. I found the manual, I'll see if I can find a picture so you can kind of see what it looked like. Looked like that. So you finally got a proper, proper keyboard. Interestingly enough, 
did I just find out they did actually make it to North America the chipset the hardware was sold to Timex who made the Sinclair 2068 I guess the 2068 is just to kind of bring it in line with the Tari or you know to just make it feel that it was even though it looked like a computer it was you know you could clearly play games on it now Sinclair was sold to Amstrad because Sir Clive Sinclair is much of a genius as he was made an absolutely massive cock up you know that destroyed his reputation and his company he decided that he wanted to build an electric car I, I say car car is too strong a word transport I say transport it was a trike it was a trike that ran on batteries and um, you could actually supplement its power with pedals or pretty much anything that went uphill with a slightly incline of more than that then you had to pedal funnily enough I remember Blue Peter program when I was a kid and Elton John actually bought some it, yeah, it, it was stupid the irony is now if you release this now with how obsessed everyone is with the environment in green it probably would have been an absolutely massive success but yeah it, it tanked and it destroyed him and it looked stupid I'm going to show you a picture it looks like this Now anyone who's not familiar with this hardware is probably looking at it and thinking just how co good could games be on its, you know, its very, very limited hardware. And yes, it was very limited, but programs just came up with a massive, massive amount of ways to utilize it. And put it this way, it died in 1992. It was an 8-bit computer from 1982 that died in 1992, at which point obviously the Mega Drive, the Atari ST, the Amiga 500, and and snares were knocking around so you know it had a good set of innings but as for the games all the arcade titles of the time were on him pretty impressive they were too you had Outrun, Enduro Racer, Afterburner, Thunderblaze, Space Harrier, Space Harrier was brilliant on this it was a pretty damn good representation of the arcade machine you're probably thinking no way type in Space Harrier Spectrum on YouTube and you'll see what I mean yeah um our type on this our type on this is second only to the Sega Master System is my favorite 8-bit port of our type and it's just this machine was you know make no doubt if you aren't familiar with it this was a beast of a games machine an absolute beast now let's show you some games to give you some kind of impression of how many games I played when I was a kid this is one box of them there are three more of these seriously I'm surprised I even passed my exams at school when I spent this much time gaming now I'm not going to show you all of them because I could fill up you know a whole SD card talking about games. I'm just going to show you some notable ones. Robocop. Amazing game. Broke a record for how long it spent at the top of the charts. Charts? Charts. Our type. The original tape that came with the Spectrum that taught you how to use it. My first game I ever bought. Halls of the Things. What a waste of pocket money. That game was shit. Fish. Text based adventure. Warlock of Firetop Mountain, a fighting fantasy game book. Sinclair ZX Spectrum Flight Simulator. You actually had an overlay to put on the keyboard to play that. Sega's Alien Syndrome. Wasn't made by Sega. Third parties licensed the right to make these games and make their own versions of them. Oh, Rambo. I remember Rambo because it was advertised in the magazines for six months before it came out. So we all pre-ordered it and then it never came. Knock Off of Pac-Man, Gobbler Ghost. License uh, from 2008, Rogue Trooper. Promotional Weedabix game. Uh, it's basically Space Invaders with Weedabix. Yeah, I know, sounds weird. Transformers. You see, there were some big licenses on this system back in the day. I really like that game. I've played it since on emulation and it's crap. Free tape that came on the front of a magazine. Um, this was like one level of Driller. Yeah, a first person game with 3D graphics. Proper full 3D graphics on a 48K machine. Crazy. Invincible Island, Adventure, Mini Office, because apparently you could run your office on a Spectrum. You would be bankrupt in minutes. Absolute classic school days. Anyone who's owned a Spectrum knows what I'm talking about when I say school days. Another classic. Uh, Sequel to Lord to the Midnight Beyond. Doom Dark's Revenge. Another great, great text based adventure. I never got anywhere in that. Ducula, Astronomy, yeah, that was my dad's. 
I could go on forever, but like I said, I'm just going to fill up an SD card. But you get the idea. I've got games coming out my ass for this system. So there you go. That was my ZX Spectrum 48K. Now, as I said, I do have a Spectrum 128K Plus 3 knocking around somewhere, but at the moment, it's still MIA. But yeah, I have such fond memories of that machine. I have such fond memories of arguing with people at school who had Commodore 64s about which was the best machine. Clearly, it was a Spectrum, but that's just my own personal opinion. Um, yeah, ZX Spectrum 48K. That machine is the reason I am a gamer. Seriously, if it wasn't for that machine, I don't even know if I'd be gaming now. Such a big part of my childhood. Can't say enough good things about it. Thanks for watching.